This is a horse on me. But I did find out that in a race for life and death, the police laboratory is where they make the photo finish. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar to Hartford Branch, Lloyd's Underwriters Association. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the circumstances threatening the life of the insured, the racehorse pile driver. Or, he'd have been way off his feet if I didn't know my oats. Or, it's great to get a kick out of life so long as it isn't a kick in the head. Expense account item one. 18 cents, one package of cigarettes. You may consider this a personal item, but uh, that's where this case really started. At the cigar stand, ground floor, terminal office building, here in Hartford. I had come down in one of the elevators and noticed a little guy with a cane standing with a starter. After I passed them, I felt myself being pointed out. And not being the type who likes being followed for long periods of time... I gave myself a good reason to stop and look things over. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hiya, Mac. Give me a pack of Luckies, will you? Uh, I just sold you a pack when you came in. I know. But things may really start smoking any minute. Here. Uh, good morning to you, sir. I've been led to believe that you were one Mr. John Dollar. Would that be a fact? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Dollar. What can I do for you? Well, I am quite a famous fellow myself. Perhaps you've heard of the fabulous jockey Earl Sand? Yeah, but... Uh... Well, next to him, I was among the best. May I introduce myself? I'm the famous little Nettie Montana, sometimes called the short Johnny Longdon. Shake hands. Oh, how do you do? Oh, to business. I think I have a way for you to solve my problem and make yourself an honest buck besides. Oh, now, whoa, pony boy, you're wasting your time. I don't bet the horses, and when I do, I don't buy tips from touts. Oh, now, wait a minute, pal. I did not introduce myself for the purpose of being insulted. I will have you know that I, too, do not consort with touts. I will thank you to keep a civil tongue in your head. Oh, I can see this is going to be one of those days. What is your problem, mister? Well, it is a problem best not overheard by people in the lobbies of office buildings. But this much I can tell you. It is about a horse and $50,000 insurance. That is why I came to you. Well, I'd be richer if I'd known more about horses and poorer if I'd known less about insurance. Maybe in this thing I can break even at least. Come on. I uh, hope you are not too much of a purist to ride in a taxi. Little Nettie looked like he'd stopped growing physically at the age of 14. And every once in a while he talked like his mind had also called it quits at about the same time. The only thing slick about him was his hair. The only thing sharp, his clothes. Liars always talk too much, and little Nettie wouldn't say a word until we were inside my apartment. So even before he started his pitch, I half believed it. Well, to take it from the beginning, I was born in a stable, and that's not just a figure of speech. They brought the hot water in a feed bucket, so you can understand my deep affection for horses. Yeah. Now... On top of that, kindly consider this. Mm -hmm. One horse in particular, a very brave steed by the name of Pile Driver, has not only made me very famous, but has also made me a very large pile of hay. I have ridden Pile Driver to a win position since he was a maiden. Pile Driver, huh? Quite a hunk of horse. Uh Uh-huh. Ah, you remember. Yeah. Then you might also remember that he was on his way to becoming one of the big money winners of all time until I had to go and fall off a livery stable horse while teaching a girl how to ride in Central Park. It busted up my leg, and I might add, my future. To say nothing to pile drivers, he hasn't won a race since I got grounded. Yeah, well, what's all this got to do with insurance? Mr. Dollar, they are going to murder him. Oh? Can you guess why? I can try. Pile driver is heavily insured. He's also no longer winning races. He's also a man who can't have a family. No good for studs. So if Pile Driver should trip and break a leg, the owner would be entitled to shoot him and he'd still collect the insurance. 
I know. It's been done. You have hit the horseshoe nail on the head. Mr. Dollar, I have a considerable bundle of money stashed away, and I am willing to devote a considerable lump of it to the purpose of saving pile driver. Now, maybe you wouldn't understand such a thing, but I happen to love that horse. I understand it, Nettie. Where is he? Well, he is currently stabled at a track named Hiawatha. Oh, by the shores of Gitchigumi? No, no, by the shores of Lake Michigan. This is located slightly north of a place called Chicago. Five telephone calls and a few hundred questions later, I learned that Piledriver was insured by your company. Got the assignment and was on my way. So, expense account item two, airfare, Hartford to Chicago, $57.72. Little Nettie insisted on coming along, and he kept the hum of the plane from being humdrum as follows. Well, Johnny, the gentleman who owns Pile Driver is an old Kentucky mint julep sponge named Colonel Faraday Bushnell. Mm -hmm. Now, this character has a very black heart hiding beneath a head of white hair. I I trusted him until I heard him say what he was going to do. From then on, I have been seriously tempted to wrap these hands around his neck and squeeze... All I can say is he had better not hurt Pile Driver. Expense account item three $16.40. Cab fare, Chicago Municipal Airport to Hiawatha Racetrack. Arrival time 10 a.m. To me, a racetrack always smells good of horses, green grass, and excitement. Here you are, driver. Keep the change. Well, this, as the saying goes, is it, Mr. Dollar. You will have to take it from here. Okay. Oh, hey, uh, one last word of warning. Watch out for his daughter, Lila. Why? Is she dangerous? To a guy like me? No. But to a guy like you, yes. Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, miss... Can you tell me where I'll find the boss around here, Colonel Bushnell? Oh. Mm. I was just going to chase you away. But you don't look like just another hay and grain merchant. What you selling? I'm not. I'm buying. Where's your daddy? How do you know the colonel is my daddy? Well, he told me he had a pretty daughter. Oh, well, thanks. Just who are you, mister? Well, as for the name, that's Johnny Dollar. As for my business, that's trying to buy one of your father's horses. Well, the colonel won't be back for a little bit, but I'm bossing while he's away. I'll tell you now, I don't think he's figuring on selling any of his horses. But I'll be glad to show them to you. Good enough. But there's uh, only one I'm really interested in. Pile driver. Pile driver? Why, no, Daddy wouldn't sell him. Why not? Well, he's practically one of the family. He, he put me through the last two years of college. Do you mind if I see him anyway? Why, no, not at all. Right over here. Okay. Here, baby. You have company, darling. Meet Mr. Dollar. Hello. Quite a horse. No, he's just a perfect deer, aren't you, darling? Mr. Dollar, why do you want to buy Pile Driver? Oh, he's a great horse. Got a great record. Have you been following him lately? Yeah. Oh, no, he hasn't been winning. That ought to make his price cheap and the odds long when he gets back running. I just happen to think I can make a winner out of him again. But his spirit's all gone. How do you think you're going to do that? Well, if I told you, his price might go right back up. Johnny, darling, hmm? I can't help it, darling. Hey, well, Kiss wait a me. minute. Let's let go. Wait a please, minute. darling, please. Uh, well, uh, it was great fun. Uh, but what was it for? Johnny, you shouldn't have right out here in the open. Huh? Oh, Leo. Yeah. What's going on? Now, wait, Leo, honey. This guy ain't your brother. He'll wish he was. Besides, that's no way to kiss brothers. You, get out of here. Look, Buster, if you aren't this girl's father, you'd better start doing some wishing. Oh, you think so, huh? This is the roughest game of post office I ever got mixed up in. like that, please? Johnny! Johnny, what are you doing to him? Hammer heads like this hammer locks. Let him get tough now and I'll bust his arm. Gentlemen, gentlemen. What's going on here? You spectators there, run along now about your business. Leo, I must say I am surprised at you, fighting in front of a lady. Get him off of me. Here, young man, I demand that you dismount, Mr. Corbett. Sooner or later, I guess I'll have to. 
Now, listen, Leo. Are you paying close attention? Uh, yeah. After I let you up, if you make one move, except away from here, I'll give you a pair of fat ears, okay? Now, look at the suit. I'm going to have to start wearing knee pads. Come on, Leo, honey. Let's get away from here. I hope you're not blaming me for what happened. I don't I know. Hold up, Now, see here. I demand an explanation. So do I. I came here to get in the horse business, and I end up in the fight racket. Who is that guy? That gentleman, sir, is Leo Corbett, a brother horse owner. And I might do the favor of warning you that Mr. Corbett is a hard enough man in business dealings. But when it comes to my daughter, he's downright violent. Your daughter was downright impulsive. Maybe so. But Leo is hardly the type to stand by while some other fellow kisses his girl. And I saw that happen with my own eyes. Well, don't let it worry you, Colonel. I didn't come here to collect lipstick samples. Well, there's one thing I can be glad about in my encounter with Mr. Leo Corbett. What is that? That he isn't James J. Come on, Colonel. Let's talk business. Hey, bartender. Hey, Mr. Dollar, over here. Oh, uh, never mind. There's my man over there. How are you, Nanny? Oh, I'm fine. Hey, but you, where did you catch that mouse under your eye? Oh, I'm sharp as a trap, I am. You were so right about Miss Bushnell. She's not only dangerous, she's daffy. Huh? I didn't know she could hit that hard. Oh, she didn't. Let's just say that she has a novel way of introducing people to her boyfriend. Oh. You know him? Leo Corbett? Well, if I knew any more, I'd be the racing commission's witness. He owns a string of very fast horses who run very slow until the odds get right. Then he bets him up to the brisket, wins himself a potful. It's also rumored that he is uh, stiff competition to the Perry Mutual machines. He books big bets among the owners. Well, they'll catch up to him sooner or later. They always do. Amen. But uh, about that yeah. human glue factory, my friend, the horse-killing colonel, what's with him? Well, I offered him $60,000 for file driver. Huh? That's 10000 more than he'd get if he knocked him off and collected the insurance. Yeah, well, where are you going to lay your mitts on 60 Gs? I haven't got that kind of dough. We don't need that kind of dough, little Nettie. You see, I told Bushnell that I was sending to California for my private vet and that he'd be here in three days and that once he pronounced the horse sound, I'd give him the money. Yeah, but that only means that pile driver is safe for another three days. And then what? And those three days, it's up to me to prove intent. And if it's there, I'll prove it and have the policy canceled. Once that's done, he'll probably be willing to pedal a horse for 10000 That I can handle. But in the meantime, I'm not taking any chances, see? I'm keeping Pile Driver under my own personal eye. I wish you wouldn't, Eddie. We don't want the colonel getting suspicious. I can't help it, Mr. Dollar. I just can't help it. Okay, Nettie, but don't blow it. Be careful. <laughs> Like all racetracks, Hiawatha was surrounded by motor courts and bungalows with rooms for rent. So, expense account item four, three dollars, room rent. I set the tin alarm clock for eight and my ear for any time and went most of the way to sleep. First things being first, I dreamed of girls. Then, I dreamed of fire engines. And suddenly, I realized why. I was hearing some. I bounced out of bed and over to the window. There I saw an incendiary sunset hanging over the racetrack stables. I jumped into my pants and into the landlady's car and got over there as fast as a 1929 Ford could take me. Hey, you. You. What? How'd it start? I started to those tables. I don't know how, but the guards were looking for a little guy with a lamp who was hanging around. Oh, where'd he go? I didn't see him, but I hear he ran in the fire and didn't come out. Some crank, I guess. I had one particular horse to get to in a hurry. And I hoped one particular guy. The door to pile driver's stall was closed and padlocked. I crowbarred the stable out of the wood with the pick end of a fire axe. Threw the door open. Grabbed a lungful of fresh air, closed my eyes, and slammed into the smoke. I could have been smoked to death, burned to death, or stamped to death, but I had to take the chance. Steady, yo. Whoa, whoa, pile driver. Now, take it easy. Easy, easy, boy. I whacked him on the rump with the axe handle and dropped it. 
I slipped to my knees, started groping across the straw-covered floor. I knew that if there was any air in there, that's where it would be. And if there was an ex-jockey in there, that's where he would be. And that's where he was. In the first corner I tried. I threw off his backwards toward the door, dragging him inch by inch out into the clean, cold shower of fresh night air. But I could have saved myself the trip. Little Nettie Montana was dead. He'd had a horseshoe hung on his forehead, but not for luck. And all I could think of at the moment was a jockey's best friend is not always his horse. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... May we take just a moment from tonight's Johnny Dollar story to remind you that three more fine adventure shows come your way each Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. First, there are the adventures of Philip Marlowe, based on the smart and tough private eye created by Raymond Chandler. Second, there's Gangbusters, one of the most famous crime shows on the air, reenacting outstanding police cases in real life. Third, there is Escape, a highly unusual adventure show which fulfills your need for Escape. Hear these three, Philip Marlowe, Gangbusters, and Escape, along with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, every Saturday night, won't you? Tune in, tune in this fall, for the shows that you love best of all. Listen carefully. Here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Tough luck. Nice try, little Nettie. Mr. Dollar, Mr. Dollar, this is horrible. I hope it's little Nettie. It sure is. What's left of little Nettie? You don't... Yeah, I mean he's dead. You know, when I was a kid, I knew about a story with a horse and a woman in it. Helen of Troy. I should have remembered that before I tangled with you. Why don't you get lost? Well, whatever's the matter with you? Look, Miss Bushnell, two minutes after I met you, you bagged me into a fist fight with your boyfriend with a phony kiss. I don't know how much you had to do with putting little Nettie where he is, but I intend to find out. Why, you're insane. Any fool, even you, Mr. Dollar, can plainly see that this boy's been kicked in the head by a horse. Lila, Lila, child, what are you doing here? Why, I saw the... What? Who's that on the ground? Why, it's little Nettie. Don't tell me he's dead. What would you be if you got kicked in the head by a horse, Colonel? Why, why, the poor boy. I held this lad in deep affection until just a few months back. He was my best jockey. What on earth was he doing around here at this time of night? From all I can see, little Nettie swapped his life for pile drivers. As small as he was, it's a pretty big price to pay. Although I guess you wouldn't think so, would you? What? What's that? I demand an explanation of precisely what you mean, sir. I mean that to some people, a dead horse is more valuable than a live one. Too bad you can't go count your money. I gotta take my friend to the morgue. An hour later, little Nettie was resting better than I was. I'd made my report to the police and was back pacing the floor of my rented room. There wasn't a long walk. Yeah? This is Lila Bushnell. I gotta see you right away. Why don't you start another fire? That'll draw me. I didn't have anything to do with that fire, but I must talk to you right away. Where can I meet you? Have you got a car? Yes, yes, I'll come any place. Pick me up here in 20 minutes. Come alone, and we'll take a little drive to the country. I want it to be just the three of us. You and me and the dewdrops. Dawn was making a dark gray promise in the sky when she picked me up. And a few easy-to-please birds had found something to sing about. During the first five miles, Lila denied everything except that she was a woman. And there was no hiding that. Her pull in under a tree and said, Well, then why'd you call me? It it was something you said to my father about about a horse being more valuable dead than alive. You sold me out once. What are you planning on now? Selling out your old man? 
You women. You know, if the truth is ever told, it'll probably come out that Goldilocks cut her grandmother's throat to swipe the gold out of her teeth. Please don't make fun of me. Fun, she calls it. Well, if you got something to spill, get it off your chest. My father owes Leo Corbett $50,000. He lost it betting on pile driver. Leo's been demanding his money, and father doesn't have it. And I heard Leo practically order father to destroy pile driver for the insurance. And what did Daddy dear say to that? He, he said he'd do it. But I know he wouldn't. I know he didn't set that fire. How do you know? I, I just know, that's all. Now, that'll sound good to a jury. Why are you coming to me with all this stuff? Because you're our only hope. Can't you buy pile driver right away? It would solve everything. Everything but one thing. What's that? Why did you go to all that trouble to get me punched in the eye? Oh, that? Yeah. I just wanted to show Leo that he wasn't going to have everything his own way. And you look strong enough to do it. Wow. That's a stupid answer. Why not? Makes a stupid kind of sense. She dropped me off at my rooming house where I dropped off to sleep. It was, however, only a four-hour plunge. Expense account item five, six fifty. Cab fare to headquarters, homicide division, Chicago police. That's one city where the cops still wear an old-fashioned star, but they sure do operate with a new fashion speed. As witness, the enclosed report made by Lieutenant Craig six hours after filing of inquiry. According to the findings of the autopsy dollar, your hunch, or whatever you call it, was right. The deceased, uh, little Nettie, was not kicked to death by a horse. Examination of the wound reveals that it was administered by a new horseshoe. A shoe on a horse's hoof would have left traces of uh, straw, etc. We say that the fatal weapon was swung by person or persons unknown. As you suggested, he'd have to have been standing on his head to have the horseshoe make the mark it did if the horse had kicked him. The lieutenant had made only one mistake. He should have said person or persons known. Expense account item six. Ten cents. Two telephone calls. The idea I was working in, I'll give you for nothing. Expense account item seven. Six fifty. Cab fare to administration building. Hiawatha racetrack where the afternoon's program was in progress and uh, where I got the wholehearted cooperation of the track officials and the use of a vacant office in which to hold the meeting I had set up. I sat myself in a swivel chair and waited. Come in. Mr. Dollar, I can't tell you how happy I am that our little transaction is about to be consummated. If you have the money with you, sir... Pile driver is yours. Now, wait a minute, Colonel. Let's not go consummating too quickly. But, my boy, you indicated over the telephone... I indicated over the phone just this. I said my offer was as good as it ever was. And to tell you the truth, it's not very good. Now, see here... Who's that? Sit down, Colonel. Come in. Why, Leo, what are you doing up here? Anytime anybody shows up to hand over 60000 to you for pile driver, I'm going to be here. That's exactly what this smart guy called me up to tell me he's about to do. Now, now, gentlemen, gentlemen, let's take it easy. Before I do anything, I want to make sure I'm not doing business with a murderer. Sir, I demand an explanation. What about you, Leo? Yeah, so do I. Well, here it is. The Chicago police know two things. One, that last night's fire was set. And two, that little Nettie was murdered. And that little Nettie got a couple of lungfuls of smoke before he got hit over the head with a horseshoe. That means that whoever hit him over the head sucked in some smoke, too. Well, I've never heard such a pack of nonsense in my life. What are you getting at, wise guy? Just what I told you. I don't want to do business with a murderer, especially $60,000 worth. But I've made it easy on you to prove that you aren't. You see, I got a doctor in the next room with portable X-ray equipment. If you've got fire smoke in your lungs, it'll show up. Now... How about it? Why, this is ridiculous. Why don't you leave the Dick Tracy stuff to the funny papers? Because I don't feel like laughing. Now, once more, how about it? Get it. I, I still don't know what this tomfoolery is about, and I, I'll feel downright silly while I'm doing it, but I'm willing to take my chances. Okay. Leo, you're first. Follow me. Yeah. Oh. Turning your back on a murderer is no way to stay healthy, but very often it's a good way to get him to make his move. This one did, right out the door, knocking me down en route, and the chase was on. Out of the building, and out toward the grandstand, and the racing circle. And there they go, on the 
It may have been Dreamy Boy at the quarter and on the track. Well, it was Mike Quarry by 50 lengths as he headed up an aisle into the grandstand. Dreamy Boy was still doing fine down there. And I was moving up, up here. But up near the top of the grandstand and onto the ramp leading to the press box section. Just as Dreamy Boy hit the three-quarter, we hit the grandstand roof. And then we went into the stretch. Hey, Corbett, it's hopeless. You can't get much farther. You're running out of roof. I slid behind a ventilator and showed myself to draw his shots. He was lousy. If he hadn't been, he'd be dictating this with an air-conditioned elbow. Okay, Corbett, you've had it. I've been counting your shots. Corbett tried a few ventilators himself. And then apparently he decided the second time he fought me, he'd do better. He rushed in swinging. I was doing great training punches, but he finally moved inside and threw one. I ducked low, but he came up fast with his knee. I sat down, and he took off. Straight to the back corner edge of the pitched roof. He swung over the side and started to shinny down the 100 foot rain pipe. But that pipe was built to carry rain, not people. At the finish line of one tiny segment of the human race, it was gambler, arsonist, murderer, Leo Corbett. By a head. Expense account item eight. Dinner for two at the Shangri La in downtown Chicago. Thirty-four dollars and forty cents. Uh, dinner itself only took forty minutes and eight of the dollars. The rest of the evening and the money was spent listening to the story of her life. A story which would not, by any means, win any Pulitzer Prize, or, for that matter, any husbands. But sometimes when you're interested in a girl like Lila, you have to act like you're interested in what she's saying. Expense account item nine, $57.72. Airfare, Chicago to Hartford. Item 10, $1.50. One book to read on airplane titled, How to Win at the Races. As if I just hadn't found out. Uh, expense account total, $1,449.22. I guess you could call that horse sense. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Bill Conrad, Dora Singleton, Jerry Hausner, Herb Butterfield, and Hal March. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Those mystery adventure shows we mentioned earlier, the fun and music and fabulous jackpot of Sing It Again, and two outstanding music shows. They're on tap for you every Saturday on most of these same CBS stations. Gene Autry comes along with his sagebrush ballads, and Vaughn Monroe is due with his songs and his great orchestra. In fact, you're invited to stay tuned right now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, for it follows immediately over most of these stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.